Hello and welcome to Bloke Off The Range. I'm doing the Swiss Classic Bivac trip in the Diemtigtal, uh, sort of three day organised hike. We've got about 40 people doing it. Took a couple of days off work and uh, as usual I'm completely overloaded but also, because I like to double up on everything, we're doing a bit of a kit test. I'm, I've got several bits of uh, Varastalaka's Sama equipment on me, a uh, Sama Merino polo shirt, which will be absolutely honking by the end of three days, some windproof trousers, which thus far are absolutely excellent, and as my warm layer, Varastalaka were very kind enough to give me to test a uh, wool shell TST jacket, which uh, thus far I've worn it a few times and it's great, so we'll, uh, see how it holds up on the hill. Now, weather forecast, uh, it changed every day during the week. We were looking at it, expecting to get absolutely wet today, since I have my waterproofs. And uh, honestly, this 60 litre bag does not have any luxuries in it. It's uh, pretty much um, everything I'll actually use. But actually the weather's looking okay, but in the mornings it's gonna be pretty chilly. So we shall, uh, we shall see how it goes. The Swiss Classic organization provide food, mark the route, there's uh, maps and, uh, and things provided. Uh, we've got uh, trekking meals for some of the time and uh, Friday evening we'll be cooking fresh in groups, so that should be interesting, meet some nice people. Uh, yeah, I'm already a few kilometers in. Uh, decided not to film this introduction right down at the start because there was the river right there, lots of people and uh, immediately after the start we had like 500 metres of height gain in not very many kilometres so I was a bit of a sweaty mess. This is the first kind of flat bit but carrying 16 or kilos I'm still uh, puffing and panting a bit. Not as fit as I should be. But, uh, yeah, anyway, well, let's squat down and uh, show you the route. So they provided us some handy maps and we start at Oydintigen here at the mouth of the Deem Tigtal. We go up there. I've got to about here so far. We go up there and uh, Rinderalp probably get a coffee and up to Turner. There's the first possibility of a camping site here which apparently nobody ever uses. I'm planning on getting to Obra Bufal here, the, uh, uh, the campsite most people will be using tonight. Now you can do the walk over three or four days. I'm going to do it over three. So day two we're going to be going over the Niederhorde, around the Seibergsee. That's places to get uh, uh, coffee and stuff, which is nice. And then round here, Grumat. Uh, I'm guessing I'm going to spend the second night here. Not sure. Uh, you're pretty much free to free to choose. Up and over, over the page, over the page, over the Grimmy for Furky, down into the Fermiltal, up over, over this huge thing here, it's the Furky, down towards Adelboden, and then uh, up, 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 and down over here, Hanemos, this is all ski area in the winter, and down there, this is going to kill my knees, and get to the end there. And I apologise if any of that went a bit out of shot, because I'm working in bright sunlight. So they've given us this handy height profile thing with the uh, horizontal kilometers and the what they call Leistungskilometer. And horizontally it's 62 kilometers, but when you take the height gain into account, it's 110. So we are currently about here, um, five linear kilometers, but a lot more Leistungs kilometers in there. And the way they work out the Leistungs kil kilometers is for every 100 meters of height gain, they add a kilometer. Uh, you can also, for every 150 meters of steep descent, add another one, but uh, this is just height only. And uh, we shall see. And uh, Obra Bufal is, uh, is 37 Leistungs kilometer. And uh, we'll see what time we get there, and then set the tent up and have some dinner. So having stowed all that paperwork in the handy map pocket on these uh, trousers, I thought I would uh, show you of any, any points of interest along the way. As I said, the, the, the initial drag up, there really wasn't anything to see. We're pretty much just walking up through uh, uh, Deemtigen village. Actually, I guess I could have shown that. Um, and then just sweating it up through, uh, through the woods. And now we're getting into more open country, so there will be more to see. Um, I'll talk about the various bits of equipment as it becomes pertinent going round and uh, 
afterwards, after it's all over, I will do a full review video of uh, the equipment, particularly the, uh, the wool shell jacket, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how, how that performs. It's not a Swiss walk without cows. I think I spoke too soon about the weather. It's uh, just starting to spit a bit. So the weather forecast was wrong again. Yeah, hey. Nearly got the park of the high gain out of the way. Just a few more false crests and I'm sure we'll be there. Honestly. Ah, beautiful view. Looking down to the tuners, eh? Sigris Hill on the other side. Yes, the top of this bit anyway. Rinderalp, where it's about quarter past 11. So we should get a coffee or something at, uh, at the little farm here. Whew. That is quite a pull up. And uh, the weather has mostly held. We've had a few drops of rain, nothing too serious. The rain has restricted itself to just a few drops, luckily. So uh, I'm not going to rearrange myself. But, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's get there. And tomorrow we're going to be crossing over to the Fennel Tal over there. So that was a bit epic. That was... Um seven kilometers along with about 1100 meters of height gain and it took about two and a quarter hours uh, had a nice little coffee here and then we'll be continuing up to Turner before uh, breaking out the lunch things now what's quite handy when you walk in Switzerland is that there's these troughs all over the place and there's a general rule if it doesn't say kind think plus you can drink the water so uh, it's kind of handy for refilling your bottles but not from this one this means it's got some nastiness in it. I mean, sometimes it literally just comes off of a reservoir off the hill and it's just, uh, it's just groundwater, but uh, they test it. If it's, uh, if it's good enough, they don't mark it. If it's not drinkable, they uh, mark this, or if they can't be bothered to test it, to be honest. And everything's so fantastically well signposted, except on the odd occasion when it isn't. So the route is marked with these painted lines, which indicate it's a mountain uh, walking route, not a village one. And uh, the game is, in the clag, spot the next one. This one is there. And uh, the angle gives you an idea of whether you go straight on or left or right. Sometimes hunting these can be a little on the exciting side. But, uh, anyway, spotted the next one, so up we go. And here we have a clear indication to go left, so we've got to play spot the next one, which is going to be somewhere over there, somewhere, um, yes, this could get interesting, this looks vaguely like a track, oh, oh, there's one, I'm going to have to consult the map. Because there's one up there. Yes. Um. Uh. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing we're at that corner there. Um, that looks to be about right. So this is a perfect example of when the uh, signage is not as clear as it could be. Now, of course, with hindsight, we know that the arrow pointing down is for those coming down the hill, but when you're coming up in the clag, it's not always very clear. And then here, 
on this stone that you can only see when you like get right on top of it, we clearly see how it's meant to go. This is, uh, as I said before, it's, it's normally very well marked, except when it isn't. And, uh, and then it can be kind of confusing sometimes. But, uh, yes, anyway, uh, my wife would confirm that my map reading skills are uh, junior officer level, so <clears throat> yeah. This, the less said about that, the better. Really getting into the clag now. Look at that whipping across. It's almost like whales, but bigger and taller and with more trees. So Turner's the next big stop, another 40 minutes, I'll probably be quicker than that. It's uh, 12.23, I would quite like some lunch already, but uh, I said we'll make it there. Hopefully there'll be other people there. So, typical bad luck bloke, uh, it started to rain kind of properly, so I stopped everything and put my Gary Gore-Tex on, and uh, it's pretty much stopped again now, so that was a complete waste. Oh, now it's starting again. Oh, um, well, I should be used to it being British. This is very British weather. It doesn't bother the cows too much, though. So I made it up to Turner, the highest point of the day, at uh, 2,079 metres above sea level. Perfect for a spot of lunch, in the traditional Swiss way, with a block of cheese and a manky sausage and some bread and stuff. So, uh, yeah, luckily there's a bit of a break in the rain, but it's kind of chilly up here. I've actually brought a thermometer with me, it's about 10 degrees, which is not very warm. Uh, wind's not too bad, and I'm in the uh, Varsalika wool shell, so I'm a wool shell jacket for the first time and uh, I'm liking it. It's nice and toasty. And the, uh, the windproof trousers have been holding up pretty well, pretty impressed with them. And uh, yeah, you'll excuse me, I'm seriously hungry after all of that. So having lunch, I'm really kind of cold now, so I'm in the, uh, in the wool jacket, which is very nice and comfortable thus far. Um, and we've got about another two hours walk to the, uh, to the campsite where I can set up my little tent and uh, get myself all nice and comfortable. Um, going pretty well so far, I think. Um, that was a hell of a drag up from Oi though, jeez. I'm gonna be, uh, gonna be sore in the morning. <laughs> if I don't smash my face from tripping over something here. Right, so uh, basically it's like Wales. There's nothing to see whatsoever. Sorry, I was hoping that up on the ridge here there'd be some lovely views, but I might as well be Anywhere, really. So, uh, yeah, but, uh, let's just keep going. Well, after that knee punishing descent, I think we shall take a little break at this little hut here. Well, that's actually what we just came down and it's really rather steeper than I was expecting and I wasn't using my sticks and ugh, but uh, yeah. So oh, off we go again. Well this is a rather unpleasant surprise. One in 50,000 maps don't uh, seem to give the impression that this is quite as hard as it is. I thought all the hard up was done for the day, but no, and it's raining slightly. Uh, I am absolutely knackered, and this section doesn't have that many markers. So it's like you're following what looks like a track. Everyone's walking at their own pace. 
and this guy is hundreds of meters behind me. I'm walking up this ridge all on my own in the clag. Can't see anything. And it's like every time a marker pick comes up, I sort of breathe a little sigh of relief. And I know I'm going the right way, but it's a ridge. On the map, you're walking along a ridge for a few hundred meters. And uh, yeah, it must be right. But you can't triangulate off anything because you can't see anything. But uh, yeah, there's literally no other way this could be. Oh, there's a signpost. Oh, oh look. Just on there. Somewhere. In the clag. There we go. Oh, oh, that is a relief, honestly. Whoa. Oh, ah, burst of energy. Whoa. We steep and fairly razor edged. Oh. Where are we? Okay, we are at Chamflu, 938 meters. 40 minutes. Oh, well. And as the clag comes, the first night, campsite, finally. I'm fairly wrecked by this stage. Um, possibly regretting choosing to do it over three days instead of four, but uh, yeah, go hard or go home. Well, let's just get signed in, get my tent up, and uh, show you all that. And it's raining a bit, so sorry, there won't be any speed up of me making the tent, but that wouldn't be interesting anyway. So. So here's my little humble abode for the next couple of nights. It's a blaze orange um, little one-man tent which uses the uh, walking poles. And in here we have a nice fluffy um, feather sleeping bag with a supposed comfort rating to minus five Celsius, but that's a complete lie. A pillow because that is not a luxury item and then all my crap and uh, the kitchen area a trangia because I am a diehard <laughs> get some food on. I'm just do everything one-handed because of the camera and it's raining again. So they've given us one of the options for Evening meal, a chili con carne, all of 639 calories. Hmm, I think we'll be having some eggs and other stuff to bulk that out. Yeah, that's about right. That's about up to the fill line. Right now, turn this bugger off. Yeah. Save that for something else. Simmering. This one thing was a bit of a juggling act. There we go. Got it out in one. Right. Now, Swiss knife, fork, spoons kits don't have a knife because you have a Swiss Army knife. Only have a fork and a spoon. 
cunning. Ugh. Right, stir this up, leave it to sit for 10 minutes, and then... Yeah. At least it's zero mess, more or less. Okay, so 10 minutes are up. The moment of truth. Is this edible? Yeah, it looks like chili con carne. There you go. Things are written nutty, but I've had worse. So even in the tank with my body heat and the residual heat from the cooker, it's still not reaching 10 Celsius. Outside it's going to be below 5. Well, uh, this might be a chilly night. Okay, I think I'm going to call it quits for day one. It is currently 6 degrees Celsius in this tent here. This bag is rated for comfort at minus 5, which I know to be a bit of a lie. But, uh, we'll see whether I need to sleep in my... <laughs> We'll, we'll, um, we'll shell or not, we shall, uh, we shall see. I shall let you know in the morning how comfortable this night was, so, night. Morning, well, I survived. It's cold. Where's my... Let's have a look outside. Well, this is not raining. Right. Wet boots, wet stuff. Ah. Really need to pee, but nothing's happening before breakfast, so I'm going to get that on. Doing everything wrong. Right. Well, I guess it stayed about plus five in here, and the bag was all right. I'm wearing my uh, merino polo shirt and a thin fleece, and that was all right. Um, my head got kind of hot part, part of the night, so I had my Ended up with uh, this on and off a little bit, but uh, <sighs> right, it's a uh, no mess oatmeal. Well, still cooking, it started drizzling, sorry, I'm, I can't manage the camera and everything else I've got to do, so see you when we're ready to go. So there we go, actually I slept kind of well, uh, stayed dry, which was nice. Um, it rained on and off, but I was, in, I was asleep by about 8pm and woke up at about 7 or something, obviously restless because it's in a tent and 
but yeah, your movement's restricted and usual, usual stuff. But uh, that's the reason why the block mattress is not a luxury and the pillow is not a luxury because, I mean, I'm a side sleeper and uh, lying on a foam mat is just horrible and I don't sleep at all and I get cramp and I'll stop my excuses now. Right, anyway, I've got a belly full of uh, Dr. Erdka porridge. It's meant to be a dessert, but uh, the bags stand up to, to, to having hot water boiled into them, poured into them. And uh, yeah, onwards and upwards with day two. And uh, just to make the rest of us feel bad, who feel like we're suffering a bit, there's a young couple with a one-year-old. Uh, really makes us <laughs> feel kind of bad. But uh, yeah, the kids slept better than anyone else, probably. So uh, yeah, onwards and upwards. We're gonna uh, loop around and need a horn and uh, up to sort of my stomping ground again and uh, it should be good. Kit wise, awesome. Really, really thus far awesome. Last night I was freezing my rocks off at about five degrees um, with my, with my uh, merino polo shirt, a thin, uh, uh, thin fleece sweater and uh, this and I was warm up to there, that was, uh, all the bits covered by those were uh, nice and warm. And uh, the trousers, where are we? Trousers down here, they, uh, they also do exactly what it says on the tin. And uh, yeah, my, I have one little complaint, which is uh, the sizing and the fact I've got lots of crap around my middle because I've got the, uh, the, the bum bag for carrying, carrying the camera and my water bottle. I've got too much around my middle, so uh, uh, it's pushing them down a bit, but uh, the sizing is a is a slight issue. Now, where are we going? Need a horn, I believe. Consult the map. You need three hands when you're doing this. Yeah. Need a horn. So, let's go. So I'm at the second control post above the Sabo Gate. You can see literally nothing, which is partly why I didn't have the camera out. And the other reason why I didn't have the camera out was um, it was raining again. So I'm back in the uh, Gary Gore-Tex. Uh, it stopped again now. Apparently, according to the weather forecast, it is not going to be as bad as yesterday, and tomorrow is going to be even better, but we've already been rained on a little bit already. So, yeah, really, I mean, uh, on the one hand, sorry, this video is going to be even more boring than usual. On the other hand, less editing to do. Yay. So there's a break in the cloud, and Mad Heidi fans will recognise this bit from the trailer, and no, there is still no CGI Matterhorn behind. Well, weather's starting to clear up. Just had a very nice uh, early lunch here, and uh, we're going to keep going up this way, back into the clag by the looks of it. But uh, oh well, still got quite a long way to go today. But uh, let's see how it goes. Well, we're starting to get some of the views I was hoping, but not really. Just come up this way. Just had yet another losing the path in the clag incident. Multiple cow tracks. Whoever put out the markers assumed that you'd be able to see more than about 50 meters. But luckily, a kindly old gentleman came out of the hut up here. He would be able to see it, but it's in the clag to uh, guide us on our way. So that's uh, good. Jacket is being excellent. It really is. It was windy uh, just coming up a ridge there cut it very well. I'm hot so I got the underarm vents open and uh, yes overall my impressions of this jacket are very good. Ah finally a mark! Yes! Uh, it's well marked until it isn't and I keep saying this and I keep showing all the times when it isn't because when it is it's just like normal but uh, anyway this is what the next few kilometers will probably look like to me. So it's really not very exciting. Well, there's literally been nothing to show for a while because we've either been in the cloud or in the valley, in the trees, we were nothing to show. Had a massive descent where I needed the poles in both hands and now we've got to 
massive ascent to make up what we just lost. But uh, yeah, plus I've been walking with other people and uh, I, uh, I'm too shy to ask if they mind appearing on my random shooting related YouTube channel. Uh, so yeah, oh look a stream. There's, uh, this could be anywhere though, there's nothing particularly Swiss about this. And it's a shame that we've not been able to see the landscape. Maybe tomorrow, if the landscape wants to play ball, there's a stream, a bit of waterfall. Um, if, the, if the weather wants to play ball tomorrow, then maybe we'll see some more. In fact, what we'll be doing is crossing a, uh, an active military shooting range, thermal bag. Uh, they're stopping it for us for two uh, periods, one at 7 a.m., which is for those who want to do the whole thing in one day. Oh yeah, sorry, in three days total. And at 11 a.m. for those doing it over four days. Now, it turns out that the weather forecast for Sunday is atrocious. So uh, we really are in a situation of uh, go hard or go home, literally. So I'm going to try and go hard and uh, get over it, which means I'm going to have to get up at stupid o'clock, drag my corpse out of my sleeping bag in my tent, and uh, get to the edge of the range by 7 a.m. to go over in the first tranche and it does need the two hour shooting break to get through it so uh, there should at least be something to see there terribly sorry how this has worked out but uh, yeah at least you're in the dry not that it's raining anymore but uh, it has been <laughs> yeah onwards and upwards Which Antipodean Enfield master does this remind you of? So just out of the forest, just about to walk back into the fog, but you can uh, sort of see down the Dean Tiktal here. Just imagine what this looks like without the fog, and then you'll have an idea, or something. Now back we go, up into the fog, and over and out of the Dean Tiktal in another hour or so, I guess. So made as far as Grimmy, this is the first plausible tent place of the evening, but we're going further up. Now, they're lucky here, because they've got, up there, an outfit shaft. They, they can get breakfast and <laughs> things if they want it, and coffee. Uh, where we're going, I don't think so. So, up back into the cloud. So we've got, according to the map, about an hour and 20 of this, and it's up and over that way. <sighs> Ah, the Turkish gang or so. You're always like that. So this is the last bit of height gain of today. Then we're over into the Thermal Tal, nearly at the campsite, and uh, yeah, tomorrow is going to be a bit of a killer as well. Today has, in general, been rather harder than I anticipated. Um, surprising amount of height gain. These 1 in 50,000 maps are slightly deceptive on that, particularly with 20 meter uh, contours. Uh, and you sort of see it in numbers and, yeah, that's okay, but once you're descending hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of meters, and you'll come back up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of meters. Yeah. Ooh. Anyway, nearly, 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 nearly at the top. It's just not much further than uh, the limit of vision there. <sighs> and that marker there is the pass. So that is, in principle, all the high gain for today. Whew. Thank you very much. Whew. I think it's uh, going to have ibuprofen for dinner and breakfast because... Uh, been working some of these muscles hard because that has been hard 2023 20, and our lowest point was about 1300 so uh, we've had quite a lot of uh, high gain and I step up into the Femmel Tal leaving the Dean Tal behind 
see it again when I'm done tomorrow. <sighs> what a view again. Surprisingly, I'm only the fourth person through this one. Oh well, get there reasonably early. I mean, time-wise, time-wise it's 10 past four. It's uh, less than a kilometer to go. And it's just uh, kind of downhill into the clag. And I just got a really good zap from the previous fence. So I'm gonna be a bit more careful with this one. Hey! Hey! Two fences, two zaps. Jeez. <laughs> oh, right. Last leg of the day. Play find the marker. Ah. Fairly obvious track with, I don't know if you can see it on video there, traces of other people having walked down it. So. I've been up here a few times, but uh, only in the blazing sunshine. And, uh, after a while, a lot of these tracks seem to blend into each other. And the cows walk on the Van der Vega, and the people walk on the cow tracks. And when you've got 50 odd meter visibility, now I'm being unfair to it, it was about 100. Yeah, yeah you, can, uh, you can struggle. Well, down there in the clag is the beautiful Fermatol, which uh, at least today you're not going to see any of, nor am I. Maybe tomorrow, we shall see how it is. And here you see the problem. I've been walking along this obvious track and then suddenly there's another obvious track down there and I can't see any markers. There are literally no markers visible. Um, and on the map, there's only one track marked because it's a one in 50,000. Uh, I guess I could join Modernity and actually get a decent GPS cartography app on my phone, but that seems a bit like cheating. I'm not willing to take such a big step yet. So there's other people's footprints here. So some of the other three people who've walked down this way have walked down this way. And I guess if it turns out to not be right, I can just cut straight downhill if I don't find a marker soon. But yeah, some rocks down there that I don't think there's a marker on it, but uh, oh, this just adds to the fun of it, really, doesn't it? Hey, hey, hey. At the end of a long day, it is kind of annoying because you really don't want to walk a meter further than you have to. I didn't take a detour to show the uh, to show the red springs because really, when you've uh, when you've done more than thirty uh, Leistungs kilometer, you really. Uh, don't want to be taking a little uh, rocky scramble off up there. Uh, maybe another time I'll, uh, I'll show it. But is this a is this a marker? Is this a marker on this rock? Ooh, let's, uh, oh, let's go. I mean, this looks like a footpath. So uh, no, it's just a rock. Ah, oh, jeez. And honestly, I mean, I walked this right, in the blazing sunshine in July with the missus, and I honestly couldn't tell you because these tracks all sort of blend into one another after a while. I mean, that one's looking pretty big. But, uh, come on, give me a marker. Oi. Oh, this one's had maintenance. Yes! Oh, a marker on the backside. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. Relief, but it's typical. The first marker you see, you have to walk past it. <sighs> right, I'll stop boring you with my, uh, I'm slightly lost in the hills bladder and uh, get going. Bit of random off topic blather. These ladies over here are Simmentaler cows and these are sort of dual use cows. Uh, they don't produce as much uh, milk as the, the Swiss Brunfee, like uh, 
that one down there. Where is she? Uh, but they are worth eating afterwards. Uh, so these cows that have lived up here all of the summer and will live down in the valley being fed on hay, uh, once they have uh, dried up, reached the end of their milking lives, they will go into the human food consumption tra tra uh, chain as, uh, as Swiss, B.O., uh, sort of everything, sort of pretty high price. Um, they're not as good eating as the beef breeds, obviously, they don't produce as much meat, but in some circumstances, they're, they're economically better to farm than the Swiss, uh, the Swiss Browns or other Holsteins uh, don't, don't do very well in the mountains. You do see them occasionally, but they're a bit narrow-gated. These, uh, these ladies are, are built for the mountains. I mean, the Simmental, this is a branch of the Simmental. So they're very much a local breed. And uh, they're, they're not as pretty as the Swiss Browns. They're not quite as docile, but they're very lovely all the same. They have a charm all of their own. So I'm starting to get a bit worried, but here we are finally. Ah, right, got some uh, hot herb tea in inverted commas inside me. Get my tent up, get everything set up. Ah, whew, longer day than anticipated. Then we have one. Has the wife? Yeah. Das war's the day we have one. So I've been up here for a while now. Uh, it's about four degrees Celsius and uh, there's a reasonable wind blowing. So I'm literally wearing everything I've got. It's uh, kind of chilly. So uh, what we did today was... So we started here, went... Oh, uh, due to a bit of bad signage, we actually went here. Almost everybody ended up going uh, the wrong way. It's easier though. Round here. Oh then no, no. and then we round here. Lost a load of height here. Had to make it all back up here. Went over the page. Right. Down there. There for a total of and bearing in mind we went slightly wrong from there. It's gonna be five, ten, fifteen. 20, just under 20 flat kilometers. And it works out as 39 minus a bit. So call it about 38, 37, 35. Leistungskilometer. Uh, quite a lot of height up and down. Oberbufal uh, to Muri. So that was like, um, yeah, I like, 12.4, 13, 14, 1600 meters vertically. So actually it was uh, kind of like yesterday. And tomorrow we're going all that and it's downwards that's gonna be the big deal tomorrow. Now what makes us interesting is that we need to muster to walk off at 6.15 in the morning because we need to get down to the um, the, uh, what's it called? What's this bit of that? The thermal bag, thermal bag. Shooting range while they have a foyer pauser, or probably before they've even started, but they're giving us a two hour slot to get over. And uh, yeah, so uh, this could be interesting. I'm debating actually not eating breakfast until we've got packed up and gone. Uh, we shall see. So I'm setting the alarm for 5.30 and we will see how this goes. And I know I look an idiot in this balaclava, but it's great. <laughs> it's really a lovely being a lifesaver. Packs down to next to nothing too, because it's, uh, it's down. Anyway, dinner, cooking, uh, cooking together, and then uh, into bed and up at stupid o'clock. Well, that's it for day two. Um, alarm's going to go off at 5.30 for day three, so join me then. Quarter past five. 
good lord. Right, into the cold. Get going. Maybe manage to pour some water for coffee while I'm striking camp. Anyway, sorry, can't manage the camera at the same time. So, yeah. And yeah, it's dark. Yes, concurrent activity for the win. Quarter past six and we're off so we can get over the shooting range while it's not being used. Bit more to see this morning. So this is the thermal tile, occupied by cows and a military shooting range. And uh, yeah, now we've got a bit of light. I, uh, I did actually manage to get some food in me, alongside me, coffee. Uh, cold, but uh, yeah. And uh, wrapped up warm, took off a layer for this, and I'm regretting leaving my long guns on but there's not going to be an opportunity to take them off for a while, so I'm just going to have to suck it up, Snowflake. We're going up there somewhere. It would be utterly awesome to be able to do a two-gun match up here. Chance of that happening, pretty slim. So there's where we camped. Well, down there, now that's in the clag, up around here. And this is uh, the first bit that's not horribly steep for a while. So you can have a look at this a uh, little bit. Now we're strung out over quite a distance, sort of everybody walking at their own natural pace and there's some real racing snakes who are miles ahead and what's that? It's a chamois. No, sheep. That was quite an epic climb up. Highest point 2387. Now it's a lot of downhill which will hurt my knees. But no. Gotta go down, can't go uphill both ways. So coming down from the Furkey, and this was supposedly the good way. I've actually got a bit of view to show you for once, but I've just been slipping and sliding down this thing all the way. It's just been on clay basically, and it's all a bit sodden and waterlogged and pretty nasty. So from here on, it's looking a bit rockier. Hopefully that will be a bit better. And at the bottom somewhere, there is maybe a bite, a little uh, cafe or something, somewhere I can get a coffee or something. It's, uh, it's been hard work so far today and it's only quarter to ten, having started at quarter past six. Well, it rained most of the way up the other side, so no filming. Wanted to save the camera from the water as much as possible. Well. This is normally, uh, well in winter, this is a, a ski area. Maybe you can see some of the pylons from the ski lifts coming out of the, uh, out of the mist. But uh, walking up to the Harnamos Pass, which is a place I've eaten at before. In fact, it is featured in a, in a video, an early bloke on the range video where we did uh, the uniform test and uh, we met Aussie Dave up here. And he quite rightly castigated us for being loonies. So I'm being, this is kind of loony again. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna stop there for a coffee been eating little and often I don't think I'll uh, I'll have another full meal I've still got a sandwich and stuff in my backpack so uh, yeah in the Gore-Tex again with the uh, the wool jacket underneath it and not roasting completely amazingly so yes finally a bit of a break in the cloud so all these areas over here they're uh, hill farms for cattle in the summer and uh, they're ski pieces in the winter. Nearly there, nearly coffee time. So 
So now it's no longer raining, and I've just had a cheeky bit of cheesecake and a couple of coffees. So what we've done today so far is set off at 6.15 from about here, go all the way along there, up there, which was a bit of a death march, um, up over the Furkili, I may have said that wrong up there, but uh, I was out of breath, down there, this was just horrible, absolutely horrible, down to there, and uh, they actually signposted us off like that, probably a penalty kilometre or so for, uh, for yesterday's shortcut, and then up in the rain, getting quite damp, control point up along the ridge, up, that's where we are right now, and uh, so we've got a little bit of up, still, and then it's just down, 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 knee crushing, down, 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 to the end there. Not looking forward to the knees. This, uh, the jacket is a little bit damp now, partly from sweat, partly from the outside, but it's comfortable. I mean, it's, it's wool, it does exactly what it says on the tin. Um, I really like it. And uh, yeah, so it's the last probably two hours walk and then uh, home. And from here on out, it's a knee crunching downhill into the into the clag again, so nothing interesting to see, unless while I'm holding the camera I fall flat in the mud. Um, yeah, probably see you at the bottom then. And here we are down the bottom at Lang Simmerfella. Finally. Whew. So I made it. Finished in three days. Nifty medal. Nifty finisher t-shirt. Um, I hurt literally everywhere. Shoulders, back, thighs, knees, feet, it's hips, it's pretty bad. Um, that was a great time. Really enjoyed doing that. Met some nice people, got to walk with some nice people and uh, yeah, I was just thinking that all I was doing was going around on my own with the camera. And uh, if you remember back 15 or 20 years, on the Discovery Channel, I think it was, there was this Canadian guy sort of in the heyday of uh, proper serious survival sort of docu things, the sort of uh, Ray Mears era, so before uh, Bear Grylls was biting the heads off of things and staying in a hotel overnight. There were some guys that were doing this seriously and there was a Canadian guy who used to be dropped by helicopter into the middle of nowhere in the Canadian Rockies with the bare minimum survival gear and had to walk back to civilization. Um, only he had the bare minimum survival gear and a two or three camera setup. And there was one episode I watched where he had he explained how he did it, and he he had to do it all his own filming. He didn't have he didn't have Bear Grylls as team. He didn't have Bear Grylls as hotels. Um, he was setting up the cameras and walking through. And was saying that all the bits where he had to film, he was having to like walk through sort of three times to set everything up. Um, I mean, I, I'm not practiced at this, so just doing all my personal admin while worrying about the camera was more than hard enough. And uh, sorry if it's been deficient on that front. I mean, just as an example, this morning I woke up at, well, got up at quarter past five. There was, we'd been sleeping in a cloud all night, so there was, um, there was condensation on the inside of both layers of the tent, the mesh inner and the, and the waterproof outer. And I'd had a slightly chilly night, because I think the damp had started to get in and my sleeping bag wasn't performing as it had the night before. Um, and that was hard enough, just walking around with this one little handy cam. And I can't imagine doing that in a genuine survival situation, presumably he had a satellite phone just in case. I mean, this was luxury walking compared to that because we're never that far from civilization. A lot of the way around we've got mobile phone reception, even sometimes 3G or 4G. Um, there's all these Alpvich after these, these little farms that serve food and things. If there's an emergency, you can get out. Um, I supplemented the rations by eating lunch somewhere and having a nice slice of uh, cheesecake and coffees and things like that. This is absolute luxury 
uphill compared to the uphill both ways that uh, this Canadian guy was uh, was putting up with, and he would was walking out and not sleeping under a tent, but under whatever thing he put together, um, plus carrying all his gear. And this is 15, 20 year old gear, bigger batteries, bigger cameras, bigger everything. Um, yeah, you. I mean, poor guy, every time he forgot to press record, he had to go back and do it again. But, uh, anyway, kit performance-wise, the three Varistalika items I'm going to do in a separate video, which I'd agree with Varistalika that I would do. My non-Varistalika items, my boots, the membranes are screwed, they are shot. Uh, I've had wet feet. I'm not taking the boots off until I get home because, frankly, at least they're warm and wet at the moment and they'll slowly dry off with body heat. Um, cheap ass socks from Landy and um, Sportex or something. Nothing spectacular. I probably have blisters from coming down, but I will find that out when I get home uh, and actually take them off. Um, British Army waterproofs, well, they do exactly what they say on the tin. Um, ooh, another finisher. Um, yeah, they're simple, they're watertight, there's no vents or anything, they're just, they just work. They're, they're, I've been pretty happy with them. Um, a bit of taking the piss, all these people standing around the expensive stuff and me in desert camo nonsense. Um, yeah, my uh, sleeping bag was mostly okay, but as I've said before, the, the temperature rating on it is a complete lie. Um, the um, feather balaclava thing, that's great, like that, that cost like $12 on AliExpress or something. I kind of wish I'd had the, the, the equivalent booties because uh, I get cold feet, but uh, I'm just a wuss. Um, yeah, otherwise, uh, most of my kit has performed as advertised. Uh, wearing, where are we? Wearing that belt to carry my water bottle and, uh, and the camera, that's been a bit of a pain because around the back, the buckle <sighs> sits right where the rucksack wants to sit, so I've got a slightly bruised back. It's not been too bad, but it's been uh, a little irksome most of the way around and uh, Trangia, well it's Trangia, does exactly what it says on the tin, takes a little bit of time to warm up in the cold um, but it's fine you just sort of put it on and snuggle back down in your sleeping bag or do other things like uh, break camp like I did this morning. Um, what else? Yeah, I mean, it's just simple simple gear, nothing, nothing fancy really. Um, so there we go, I'm gonna get the bus when it arrives at quarter past, which is in another half hour. Um, there's a bit of uh, extra food and, uh, well, we're not supposed to drink the beer here because we're right next to a pub. Um, but they're giving us a nice beer, Simmentaler beer, to, uh, to to help us on our way. And uh, bus, train, pick up my car, go home, and then depending on what time I get home, I will either film the Varistalika kit review today or I'll put all this stinking stuff out on the balcony and uh, do it first thing tomorrow morning. We'll see what the, what the light's doing and if I'm absolutely wrecked by the time I get home. So, anyway, thanks for watching this video. Uh, please like and subscribe, all of that stuff. Um, the reason why I'm putting this on the main channel rather than the sort of semi-defunct bloke off the range channel is that um, on a conversation with Carl in Finland, we're saying that sometimes the off-topic stuff brings in extra interest and the more people we can get interested in the... Uh, um, uh, the serious end of shooting, target shooting, collecting, uh, military history, uh, history of firearms, things like that, the better. It's sort of the, 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 it can be the gateway in. So he's been doing his old West vignettes and things like that and uh, suggested that things like this go on the main channel but obviously not as a Friday main launch. So uh, that's what I'm doing with this. The uh, Faris Leaker kit review, the same. Um, basically the synopsis is, aside from a few minor points, it's all been great. I mean, this, this. Uh, this is, I've not taken this off. This, is, this has been absolutely brilliant and it does stink, which is great. So anyway, onwards and upwards.